Welcome back to KNTV and a story from our archives. Now, we filmed Douglas Gresham in his home in Ireland back in the noughties, and he told us how he was adopted by C.S. Lewis, author of the Narnia books. It's a fascinating insight of growing up with Lewis and his own journey to faith. My guest for this program is a member of a very famous literary family. The name Douglas Gresham is known throughout the world as the little boy in the film Shadowlands with Sir Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger. The film powerfully depicts the love story of the great C.S. Lewis and the American writer Joy Gresham. Douglas is, in real life, as in the film, the stepson of C.S. Lewis. I asked him what his very first impressions were of the now legendary writer. To tell you the truth, it was a little disappointing. Um, when you're eight years old and you, you've read the Narnia stories um, and you've had them read to you, and you're going to meet the man who was on speaking terms with the great lion Aslan and High King Peter of Narnia and all the rest, you sort of expect some stalwart figure almost wearing a suit of armor and carrying a sword. And instead, I met this uh, stooped, balding, professorial gentleman in very shabby clothes, nicotine-stained fingers and so on. So my initial reaction was one of, of mild disappointment. But it was very, very few minutes before his vibrant personality overcame any uh, appearance deficiencies there might have been. But were you aware of your mother falling in love with him? Well, I don't think she really had at that stage. Uh, this happened later. And... I wasn't aware of her falling in love, and I don't really like the term falling in love, because I think it's erroneous. Uh, this is the, the romance thing, you know, the sort of uh, floating on clouds of perfume and lace business. And of course, that isn't love at all, and romance doesn't last anyway. Love is what you do. But the growing love between them after they were married was very visible. Uh, th this amazing story of the, I hope you don't mind me using the word technically, it was actually a technical marriage. He married uh, your mother uh, in order that you might be able particularly, and your brother and, and your mother, to stay in the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, technically marrying your mother. I mean, were you aware of this? Or? Not at all. No, I, I was totally unaware of that until years afterwards. Uh, the first I knew of them being married was after uh, my mother had gone into hospital with cancer. And uh, they had So been that's a year, perhaps. Yeah, so. that, that, that would be a year. You later. weren't aware that your Not mother was married to one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Well, even, even later, I wasn't aware that she was married to one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Uh, Jack didn't come across in that way at all. Uh, I was aware that she was married to Jack, uh, and I was very glad about it. But I certainly had no uh, knowledge of him or apprehension of him as being one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Um, he didn't, he didn't ever appear to be a great man. Uh, he was just Jack. Jack, just for our I'm viewers, uh, of course, was uh, the name that his friends called him. Well, Jack so decided on his own nickname when he was a very small boy. I think he was about four, living in Belfast at the time, and there was a little dog in the neighborhood of which he was quite fond. It was run over, and the dog's name was Jacksy. So he came home that day, pointed to himself, and said, he is Jacksy, and he wouldn't answer to anything else. <laughs> at the age of four and a half, I think. So it stuck. So we can play with an it, Irish it, dog. An Irish dog. <laughs> it, it started off as Jacksy, then it became Jacks, and eventually just uh, Jack. And he was known as Jack to anyone who really knew him at all. When your mother eventually uh, took ill, and obviously this love uh, uh, comes between them in a very deep way that wasn't there with the technical marriage, I mean, mm. was that a very traumatic time for you? Yes, it was. Douglas, when your mother I mean, took ill? Well, I was 10 years old when my mother contracted cancer or was, or was diagnosed with cancer. And um, the way it came about was, a, the way my knowledge of it came about was a bit odd in a sense. I was at school, at boarding school um, in England. And I received a letter to say that when we went home, instead of going to our own home at 10 Old High Street in Headington, we were to go to the kilns because our mother had fallen and broken her leg. 
and was in hospital. And actually, to me, this was very good news because 10 Old High Street is a small, semi-detached house in a row of houses in the town of Headington. And the Kilns was a, a lovely, sprawling old house with a, a huge grounds, a tennis court and a greenhouse and old kilns to play in and a wood and a lake and all that sort of thing. Heaven for a little boy, in fact. So I was very pleased to be going to live at the Kilns. And it wasn't until I, we got home from school that Jack uh, immediately took us down to the hospital to visit our mother and did what for him, with his own background, must have been very difficult. He did it very well, actually, looking back. He took us into a small anteroom of the ward and said, uh, told us that, in fact, our mother's illness was a great deal more serious than we knew, and, and, and she had cancer. And when you're 10 years old and your mother and father are divorced, your father is thousands of miles and several years away, the only person you really know in the world, even to say good morning to, is your mother. And suddenly, um, her impending death is made very evident to you. To be that alone is, is almost indescribable. Um, difficult to understand unless you've been in that kind of situation. But I was walking back from the hospital to the kilns, and the pathway, the route, led through the churchyard of Holy Trinity Church Headington Quarry in Oxford. And uh, there's a wrought iron gate, it's there to this day, leading into that churchyard. And totally alone and grieving in a gray, featureless world, I lifted the wrought iron latch of that gate, and stepped out of our shadow lands, out of our shadowy, unreal existence, into real life. And there was a very powerful presence there in the churchyard with me, compassionate, grieving presence, sharing my pain. And I was not someone who, as a child, had a great deal of knowledge about God or religious things. I was a bit of a rebel, even at 10 years old. Um, and I'd never really prayed in my life, but I knew who he was. I knew that Jesus was there in that churchyard with me, suffering the same pain that I was suffering. And he made it plain to me I didn't hear any audible words, but he simply said that if you can't live without your mother, I can fix it. And I went into the church, which in those days wasn't kept locked. Unfortunately, it has to be today. And I knelt at the altar rail. There was no one in the church except me and this presence. And I prayed with every fiber of my being that my mother be allowed to live because I didn't think I could get by without her. And instantly, I was told that it was okay, it was fixed. I could go home and stop worrying. And I walked out of that church at peace, walked out of the churchyard, and suddenly I was back in the Shadowlands. As I closed the gate behind me, I was back in this unreal estate in which we live. And uh, I went home at peace, and my mother went into remission starting more or less that day. They had a very happy time for three years. Almost four, I think. For yeah. wonderful... Absolutely. Won the best, best four years of either of their lives. It was, but again, at the end of that four years, more or less the same thing happened. I was brought home from school to say goodbye to my mother. The cancer had re-emerged, as everyone knew it must eventually. And um, by this time I was 14, of course, and walking back from the church, not expecting it, not, not from, from the hospital, I beg your pardon, not from the church, walking back from the hospital, not expecting it in the least. Again, I lifted the, the latch on that gate and stepped back into this super real, vibrant, uh, alive existence. And again, he was there. And he said that if you can't live without your mother, it can be done again. But in all honesty, in searching within myself, I, I, I knew that by that time I had friends, I had a stepfather whom I'd grown to love, I had an uncle whom I, I loved, Warney. Um, I had people around me, and I was a 14-year-old boy and much more independent than I was when I was 10 years old. And in all honesty, I knew that I could live without my mother. So although it sounds very unoriginal, the only thing I could think of to say was that I will be done. And I walked out of that churchyard, back into the shadowy lands of this world. But she died about a week after that. Um, so yes, it, it was just a strange experience. Didn't, didn't make me a Christian. Yes, didn't make me a Christian. But you were aware of a presence and aware. Oh, I knew, I knew of who another was. world. That I knew that Jesus was there. And I knew who Jesus was. I knew mm -hmm. who God. I always believed in Jesus and in God from the, those moments on. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make you a Christian because Satan himself believes in Jesus and in God. What would you say, Douglas, was the main thing that C.S. Lewis taught you during those years when he was raising you? There are two things, that, that, two main things that Jack taught me. And he taught me them not by preaching or teaching, but by example. One was that everything one comes across in life should be examined, not simply accepted. And that includes anything to do with religion, uh, anything to do with personal problems of other people or oneself. Um, he taught me to look deeper into the millstone than simply the surface. He taught me to look into things rather than at things. His books reflect this attitude of his that you, you should look deeply into things. Mere Christianity is the result of him looking deeply into Christianity, not simply at it from outside. And the second thing, of course, was, was how to live a Christian life. 
Um, he taught by example in that sense also. He was a man who lived his Christianity. He didn't just talk about it. He didn't say all the right words uh, and, and go through the right ritualistic actions. He simply lived a Christ-like life. Was he hard to live with when he was writing? Not at all. He was the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, Jack was someone who would accept interruption every 10 minutes if necessary while he was working very hard at a book or something without the slightest degree of irritation. He was so, able to believe uh, and, uh, and to, to behave as if he believed, which he did, that our own personal work is nowhere near as important as the interruptions to it. The interruptions are the real substance of God's job for us. When eventually he died, was there some talk about a, a candle? Someone placed a lit candle on the coffin. It was taken off as they carried the coffin out of the graveyard, and it, as it stood on trestles beside the grave, the candle was placed back on the coffin, as uh, Father Ron Head said his, his prayers and so on. And the interesting thing about that is that several witnesses saw this candle and saw that it didn't move. It was a dead still day. There wasn't a breath of wind moving in the cemetery. And yet, Ron Head himself never saw it. And when I wrote it in Lenten Lands, my autobiography, Ron wrote to me and said, look, you know, there wasn't a candle. Nobody ever puts a candle on a coffin. And so I went to some of the other people who'd been there, and yes, they remembered it, but Ron Head didn't. It was just one of those things. Whether it was really there or whether the Lord simply put it there for us to look at, I just don't know. Where did you go from there, Douglas? This man has gone out of your life. Your dear mother uh, has gone, and you, you're, you're now facing life uh, without. Or running away from it, one or the other. Um, where did you go from there? My mother's best friend, uh, who was a motoring journalist, uh, a saintly lady, had always promised my mother that if anything happened to Jack, she would look after me, and also my brother. And my brother was by this time completely independent, but uh, she simply welcomed me into her home, gave me a home in Horton Come Studley, just outside Oxford. And I lived there from 1963 till 1967, more or less, uh, when I was 21 and uh, got married and emigrated to Australia. Can you tell us a little about how you met Mary? I, I, I hear there was quite a chase, quite a chase, Douglas. Huh? Yes, there was indeed. All over the world, they tell me. I was uh, a guest at uh, the farm of Sir Edward Mallet in Somerset, Charcot was his name, as uh, an agricultural student. And one morning, Lady Mallet said, oh, you'll be happy about this, Doug. Um, Mary is coming. And I said, who's Mary? And she said, uh, Mary is our niece from Tasmania. And I'll never forget it. Um, Harry, uh, who's Sir Harry Mallet now, after his father's death, he said, you'll like Mary, Doug. She's the biggest flirt in the world. And I said, how old is she? And he told me, and she was about three years older than I was. So I said, oh, she'll be too old for me. And Harry said, no, no, anything with trousers on is good enough for Mary. So, uh, and I've never let him forget that either. But uh, he and I had to go into Taunton to the railway station to pick this young lass up and her, her friend who was coming with her. And I saw Mary step down off the train and I decided to marry her because it was the girl I'd been looking for all my life. And as I got to know her personality, it was exactly the personality I was looking for. I mean, I was uh, 18 years old, barely shaving. Um, it took me, and penniless, a student. Uh, it took me three years to uh, finally convince her that she should marry me. And I'm, I still don't know why she did, to tell you the truth. I mean, she was a gorgeous young girl, absolutely stunning. And uh, the competition were all lawyers and doctors and people like that. She was a nurse working in London. So I really don't, to this day, have the faintest idea why she decided to marry me, but she did. And we've now been married 32 years almost. And you had four children? We have five children. Five children? Uh, four of our own natural children and one adopted. Right. You became a broadcaster. Well, I got in. Uh, well, that was an accident too. An accident. Uh, I, I was farming in. We, we, we managed to make it out to Australia. We emigrated on the 10 pound assisted passage scheme was going in those days. And uh, I had just enough capital that my grandmother had left me to buy a very small farm, which we did. And. Uh, because it was such a small farm, we needed extra money. And Mary never reads newspapers, never has. But one morning, she happened to pick up the local paper at our, our farmhouse kitchen table and noticed an advertisement saying uh, the local radio station needed a, a part-time announcer. Uh, if you have a well-modulated voice, why not put in for this? You know? So Mary looked at me and said, you're always talking too much. Why don't you put in for this job and see if you can get paid for it? So just for a joke, I rang the radio station. And uh, having listened to me on the phone, they asked me to come up for an interview, which I did, and I got the job. And um, I started part-time. Within three weeks, I became full-time. And within a, about six months, I was the senior announcer and studio supervisor of that small country radio station. And that started a broadcasting career, which went, I suppose, about 15 years. 
and wound up in Perth in Western Australia, uh, first of all with the commercial networks and then moved to the ABC, which is rather like the Australian version of the BBC, and spent five years with them in Perth. And was extremely successful in, in radio and television and all that sort of thing. So you're a broadcaster and you're a farmer yes. and uh, all sorts of other things. Well, when we left Tasmania, when I, I resigned from the station there and we sold our little farm, put all the capital back in the bank and quite a large profit as well. Uh, we had enough left over to buy a large car and a caravan. By this time, we had three children. So we hooked up the car and caravan and, and took it across on the ferry to the mainland of Australia from Tasmania and set out across Australia, working from place to place. And I did all kinds of jobs on that trip, um, everything from welding up cattle yards and being a stockman riding horses around cattle and sheep and servicing windmills and uh, what else did I do? I was a powder monkey on a jellignite gang blasting trenches through the desert. Uh, all this sort of thing, just all kinds of different jobs. It was a fascinating experience. And you, you were also even in Tasmania on the local fire brigade, I think. Well, that started in Western Australia. <laughs> I got involved in fire brigades in Western Australia, and uh, I actually put in a total of 20 years' service and wound up the captain of our local brigade in Tasmania. But um, I suppose every little boy wants to be a fireman. I'm just one of these people who does what he wants to be. <laughs> yes. I, I, the opportunity to be a volunteer fire officer was there, and some of my friends uh, were members, and they said, well, why don't you join us? But there's a restlessness in your life, Douglas, a restless theme. There is always an emptiness in one's life. One's always looking for something. Um, and until you grow up, you don't find out what that is. And by growing up, I mean suddenly realize that Jesus Christ is what you've been looking for all your life. But uh, in the meantime, you search for everything else. Uh, you search for anything to, to fill that, that need within you. And for some people, it, it, it becomes uh, a sport or a hobby or whatever, and they're never fully satisfying. I became a pilot. I got a pilot's license and went flying and all that sort of thing. I took advantage of my success, and I lived a fairly profligate life, um, and eventually got very bored with broadcasting. Um, it became just a, pay, a pest and a pain. So I, we, Mary and I both were unhappy in the climate of Perth, which is extremely hot in the summer and didn't really want to raise our children in a sort of semi-urban environment and decided the best way to raise our boys and our daughter by that stage as well was to bring them up on a farm. So we decided I'd get out of broadcasting, we'd go back to Tasmania where we like the climate more and uh, get back into dairy farming, which we did. Uh, so we, we sort of made the trek back, bought a big truck and put all our goods and chattels in it, had a double cab and we drove all the way back to Tasmania with this big truck. Uh, more adventures of course along the way but eventually wound up back in Tasmania running dairy farms again. And also I got into, at that time, again, the fire brigade. And I became a security officer, ran my own security agency and private investigation agency. You actually became a private investigator. Yes, indeed. My uh, goodness, Douglas. <laughs> that, 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 there must be all sorts of worlds in there. Well, it was interesting. Um, we also ran a restaurant and uh, got into all kinds of things. In any case, uh, it is in my nature always has been, to like to help people. And that's no credit to me, it's just the way God built me, I guess. And uh, eventually I tried to help someone, a young girl, through what I saw as being a very difficult, and rather dangerous time of her life. And uh, went about it in a very inappropriate way and the whole relationship turned into a semi-sexual relationship which should never have happened. Because I had no guidebook, no guideline from which to work. So I was trying to do everything in my own intelligence, and in my own uh, ability. And the results of this were fairly catastrophic, and I was forced to take a very long, close look at myself, and forced to realize that I had been living my entire life up to that point in arrogance and conceit and pride, as if I had created my own intellect, as if I was responsible for making what I was, and as if I could figure out the answers to the world's problems as a result of my intellect, which I had somehow created. And I just suddenly was, was struck with the, with the uh, conclusion, and high time, that it, I was living entirely on, on pride and conceit and arrogance. And I was forced to eat an enormous quantity of humble pie, uh, which although it doesn't taste very good, is very nutritious to the soul. And uh, realized that what I should be doing, of course, was handing my life over to Jesus Christ to run because I was making a thorough botched job of it myself. So, in more or less in desperation, actually, um, I shed an awful lot of tears. And I picked up the phone book. Our own local minister was away at the time on holiday. And I just looked up a name in, in the Church of England, uh, was, that was the church I was affiliated with at the time, in a loose sort of way. Um, and I wound up uh, talking to a very saintly man, a very good man, a good Christian man, who was the Archdeacon, or was the Archdeacon of Launceston at that time. I phoned him and I said, look, I, I'm a, 
a member of the Church of England in desperate need. Uh, I need the right of confession and I need someone to talk to. I need to really get myself right. And he said, when do you want to come and see me? And I said, how about now? <laughs> I think I went in the following day, actually, and Mary went with me. And I sat down with, uh, with Warwick and uh, told him the whole story. And we prayed a lot, and I then, then and there committed my life to Jesus Christ and asked him to take over and run it because I was totally incapable of doing so. At the time, it was, it was a very painful and very difficult procedure because I had to really admit what an absolute swine I'd been for most of my, most of my life to everyone around me, including my, my family, my children. I've apologized to everyone left, right, and center. Um, and I've had to reverse the direction of my life. Tell us how you came to this beautiful house. In about 1970-something, I think about 76, uh, I sold my, my uh, inherited shares of the copyrights uh, to this company, which had been formed specifically to develop them. And um, because I was sort of the, the, the public figure, if you like, of the family and, the, and, the, and easy to, easily accessible, and my brother's a much more private individual, uh, they began to ask me for advice on how to do this and how to do that and what should be done. And by the grace of God, um, the advice I gave them always turned out to be right. So eventually they began to rely on me fairly heavily for my advice. And um, at the time, I was trying to run several farms and a restaurant and so forth, and a security agency and a private investigation agency. So eventually I said, look, you know, I need to be paid for this because it's taking too much of my time. And if you really want me to go full time on it, which it seems to be happening, um, I need to put a, a share farm, a manager on the farms. So we did that. And uh, I went on salary with C.S. Lewis Peter Limited. And, um, became a general consultant to them, which I still am. And so we had managers on the farms, uh, none of whom worked out to be very good as it happened. And looking back on it now, I can see that the Lord was reshaping our lives to indicate that he wanted us to be somewhere else. He didn't want us farming in Tasmania. That time was finished. I mean, it had served its purpose, it was ended. So eventually we, we decided that it was time to move. And uh, we had sort of cast our minds around where we would like to move to if we, want, if we had to be on this side of the planet. I mean, the work for C.S. Lewis is all um, sort of in London and, and New York and Los Angeles and places like that. So it's very difficult to commute from Tasmania. So I had a, a trip, one of my many round-the-world trips that I used to do for, for the company. And um, my associate and myself found ourselves suddenly with some appointments cancelled and a week to spare in the middle of a, uh, of a trip. And we were in England at the time. Neither of us had ever seen Ireland, so we just hopped on a plane and came over for a look. And I fell in love with the place, I must confess. Absolutely love it. And uh, so I was telling Mary about this, and when it became more or less time for us to look for somewhere else to live, I said, look, let's go over and have a look at Ireland. And if you like it as much as I do, we'll, we'll, we'll decide to settle there. So we um, came over, and Mary was looking out of the window of the aeroplane flying into Dublin. She said, yes, this is the place, <laughs> almost instinctively, straight away. So we then started to look for a place to live. And I suppose logically, had we been thinking logically and only with sort of worldly logic, we should have been looking for a cottage. I mean, living at home at that stage were only my two daughters, myself and my wife. The sons had all moved out, gone their own way. And, um, but the Lord kind of nudged us into looking for something bigger. So we started to look around places and, and um, we had no idea what the Lord had in mind for us. We just had the niggling feeling that he had a job for us over here. So um, while we were in the real estate agency, we just looked through all these portfolios and picked out about 10 to look at. The last one he handed us was one that had come on the market that day, and it was this place, Rathlinden House. So it was also the closest to Dublin. So we'd hired a car, and we took off down here to look at this place first. And as soon as we drove in the gate, both Mary and I instinctively knew that, that this is where the Lord wanted us to be. We didn't know why, and neither of us told each other at that stage. But as we drove in, it took on that glow that strange, unearthly glow that, that sometimes happens. And all kinds of people come here, Douglas, but you don't invite them all, do you? Well, that's true. They um, come. Friends do come by invitation, but people come in need. They hear yes, about you. The, the principle we work on, I mean, Americans often ask us, what's your vision for the ministry? And we have to confess that we don't have one. And I'm not sure one should have one. Um, what we did is we simply gave ourselves, our lives, everything we have and everything we, we, we earn, own and, and buy, Everything we, that is part of us, we gave to the Lord for his use and for him to do whatever he wants with. And uh, so we rely on the Holy Spirit of God to bring the people here whom he wants to be here and to keep away from this place the people he doesn't want to be here. And once having made that prayer and made that commitment, you have to also realize that the Holy Spirit is doing just that. And we've seen evidence of this time and time again. So we are a healing and helping counseling ministry. 
Um, we are members of the International Institute of Pregnancy Loss and Child Abuse Research and Recovery, which is a psychotherapy training and treatment organization based in Canada and trained psychotherapists in uh, therapy techniques all around the world. And, um, and we have training seminars for that organization here quite regularly. We're also a seminar center for the International Society of Centurions, which is something that Philip Ney and myself, Philip Ney being the, the psychiatrist who's, who's the head of the institute, uh, more or less dreamed up together. And that is um, a grouping together of people who used to be abortionists, but have realized the horror of the crime they've been committing against God and against man and have pulled out of that industry of death. So you work in this lovely house, Douglas, but you also have this tremendous legacy of C.S. Lewis. Do you ever get weary of that? Or, or do you find that his legacy is still opening up all kinds of doors in spiritual work? It does all the time. It, it is always opening doors. But people often ask me, what's it like living in the shadow of C.S. Lewis? My answer to that is that he didn't leave a shadow. He left a glow, and I'm fortunate enough sometimes to be able to bask in that glow. Mm -hmm. But yes, it, it, is, um, it is something of a responsibility, I suppose. But I never resent it. I never dislike it. Uh, it's just the way my life is. I mean, it's a bit like saying, D do you dislike having dark hair? I mean, it's just it's the way it is. But it is massive. 40 million copies in print. So is that true? I, I mean, I don't know the yes, figures. But, yes, but, 40 yeah. million with three dozen titles and 40 million copies of his books at well, the moment a, yes, in it's print. It's a fairly large responsibility, but then you've got to do something with your life. I'm going to ask you a question which is asked of a lot of people. I suppose it's almost a cliché, Douglas, but you have been a fireman, you have been a broadcaster, <laughs> you, you, are, you have been a farmer, you are a husband, you are uh, someone who is holding a literary legacy which is one of the most massive in, in English literature. If you had your life to live over again, is there any one thing uh, in your life that you would do that you haven't done? I'd learn to fly a helicopter. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. I'm working on it. It's something I would love to be able to do. Before I die, I would love to be able to fly a helicopter. But that's just a, a, a trivial personal ambition. I mean, I'm, I, I can fly anything with wings. I can drive, drive anything with wheels, tracks, skis, floats, um, or a cushion of air. But I can't fly a helicopter, so that's something I haven't done yet. So if anybody out there has one and they have an instructor, you know, but um, the only change I would make to my life would be that I would commit my life to Christ immediately. But then I might usurp his plan. I don't know. Have you a favorite quote from the writings of C.S. Lewis that you particularly like, or, or a story from his life, an incident in his life? Uh, one of the things that, that stands mostly in my memory, one of my fondest memories of Jack's, of what Jack said at, on time, is, is, is a rather obscure, rather extraordinary one. When I was about 12 years old, it was at the dinner table at the Kilns, and I suppose seeking some kind of kudos or acclaim, I said to Jack, in front of everybody at the dinner table, you know, Jack, I said, I think my worst sin would be pride. And Jack looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and said, yes, I think I'd agree with you. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> <laughs> but by God's grace, you have uh, managed to overcome. Thank well, you. Not, well, I'm still working on it. Thank, thank you so much, Douglas, for talking to us and for allowing us to come to this lovely place.